Okay, everyone, welcome back. Okay, um, any further questions? Chapter seven. Uh, so we, we can come back to it a little later as well, right? Um, if there are further pressing questions, I know, you know, it's uh, since it's each case is very different, you know, there cannot be anything black and white. And that's why Paul also leaves it, mentions it like that, right? Um, all those different um, aspects of marriage and divorce and remarriage and staying single and all that. So there's no, you know, one uh, one thing that fits everybody kind of a thing because the scenario is different. But so he address, addresses, you know, a few of those scenarios which was relevant at that time. Um, yeah, and also the spirit behind the the commandment, right? Spirit behind the instruction, um, which we should not lose sight of, right? Okay. Okay. So um, let's look at um, just one second. Okay, yeah, let's look at uh, chapter 8. Okay. So chapter 8, he's referring to um, uh, a particular challenge, which is about things being offered to idols and eating of um, that, things offered to idols. Right? So he addresses that. Okay. So let's look at verses 1 to 3. Okay. Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. But love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Okay, so um, in the Corinthian, uh, the Corinth as a city and Corinth as a society, there was a lot of idol worship, right? Idol worship, false worship, worship leading to immorality. So it was there. And uh, so Paul is addressing that in this chapter. And he's saying, you know, uh, about things offered to idols. And he's saying that, uh, yes, that we, are, we know that we all have knowledge. We all have information. We've been taught the truth about idols. You know. But let that not make us proud, right? In knowing the truth, let us not just make that proud or saying that I know the truth and the other person does not know the truth or I know the truth, therefore, you know, this person is not walking according to the truth, therefore, I'm going to look down on them, etc. So he's saying, you know, knowledge puffs up, but it is love that edifies. So we need to walk in love. See, walking in love doesn't mean that you walk in compromise, right? So sometimes we think, okay, I need to, if, if, I, if I need to show uh, love and concern for another person, that means that I have to compromise my own standards or bring down my own standards, right? So that is not that is not what he's saying, right? Because truth and love go together, right? Like the Bible talks about how the Lord Jesus, uh, his manifestation was with grace and truth, right? So, um, so when we say, okay, uh, love... And walk in love, that doesn't mean there is a compromise of standards, godly standards. No, that is that never the intention, right? So the thing is that knowledge, you have the knowledge, you have the knowledge that what is of, what is of the truth, what is not of the truth. In applying that knowledge, either for oneself or mainly for others, you know, he's talking about others, in applying that knowledge, let it be with love. Okay, because Knowledge has this capacity to make one proud. But when there is love, it actually brings humility. It brings um, the God kind of uh, character. And therefore, we need to walk in love. And he's addressing, you know, if anyone is, thinks that he knows anything, has pride, then he do, doesn't, doesn't know it you know, as he ought to know. Right? But if anyone loves God, then this one is known by him. So it's not knowledge which you know which uh, brings us to God, closer to God. But if we love, if we love God, 
then we have that relationship with them. So loving God is important. It's the primary thing, right? Um, so with knowledge, we need to walk as people who are walking in love, because then we would walk in humility. Then we would also use knowledge rightly. I mean, we walk in love, right? So he's talking about idols. So when we, and he's talking about idols, an idol could be anything that is a substitute of God, right? Which is a God substitute. So it could be an ideology, it could be a concept, it could be anything. So here specifically, he's talking about a physical idol because Corinth was into idol worship. So as part of the worship of the idol, like we see today in today's times, there was food that was offered to the idol, right? Which was offered in a in a in a sense of thanksgiving or appeasement or whatever it was offered. And therefore, if a believer should be there and one should eat what is offered to the idol, how will that be seen? He's addressing that, he's talking about that. And also, you know, if there are things that are sold in the market, things that are sold in the marketplace like food and meat and all that. In those days, things that were offered to the idols would be specially marked because it will be like a, it is blessed, right? It is blessed by the idol, so it will be specially marked and therefore it might have a you know better price also, highly priced as well. But it was supposed to bring blessing into the you know homes and etc. So it was specially marked and all that. So for for the one who worshipped the idol, it make it was something special. So if a believer goes to the market and you know something is there which was offered to the by uh, to the idol, that is the other thing. You know, in the market, should I eat it? Should I not eat it? But he addresses this in two places. One is chapter eight. And if you look at chapter 10, he again comes back to that um, about idolatry and so on. Right? And uh, he, uh, in chapter 10, it's, it's a little more in detail about this whole thing of eating uh, things that are offered to idols. Okay. Okay. So let's look at uh, verse 4. Okay, verse 4 says, Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, that there is no other god but one. So he's talking about this whole thing of, okay, what is an idol? It's a god substitute, right? But we know that there is one true god. There is no other god. So this idol is nothing in the world, and there is therefore no other god but one. Okay, so, so even if there are so-called gods, in the heaven or the earth, um, there, yes, there are many whom people consider as gods, right? Yet, there is only one God. He says, for us, we know that one who knows the truth, there is only one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, through whom we live. So he's establishing very clear, in contrast to a, an idol, which is considered as a deity, right? We say that, saying the idol is nothing. Okay. It's, it's lifeless, does not have any power, so so he's not. Um, you don't have to give any weightage, right? You don't have to fear an idol. Uh, so that is what he's saying, right? And uh, in chapter ten, he's talking about a demonic power or a you know spirit of darkness that is behind the idol, right? But the idol, as such, uh, is saying that it is nothing. Now, the fact is, verse 7, not everyone has that kind of a knowledge. Okay, for a believer who's a strong believer, who's walking in faith, understands that an idol is nothing. All authority and power comes from God. right? And the fact that as believers, we've been given authority, right? we've been given influence and power over all the works of the enemy. So not everyone has that knowledge. So he's saying, for some, verse 7, with consciousness of the idol, until now, eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Okay, So this food offered to idol, and he goes on to say in verse 8, this food does not commend us to God. right? So it does not bring us to God, or you know, if we don't eat it, 
it does not they take us away from god so the food does not do anything of that sort so two things idol it's nothing because god is the ultimate power the true god and we know the lord jesus christ from whom are all things are to whom are all things so that's thing second thing this food is food right it does not bring us to god it not keep us away from god and it is nothing right so he's establishing that very clearly so then he goes on to talk about um verse 9 but beware okay lest this liberty now you as a strong believer you know eating that food not eating that food is not going to affect you you know that the idol is nothing it has no power and even if there are demonic powers you you have been given the authority and power to cast things out okay very clear verse 9 but beware be careful lest somehow this liberty of yours this freedom of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak okay verse 10 look at this picture this is saying for if someone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple okay so where is this believer believer who knows his authority who knows his place he is in in the temple and maybe he went there to share the gospel we don't know right maybe he's there with those people and they've offered him food offered to idols and and he's saying in that particular scenario circumstance if you should eat that idol Uh, idols the food offered to that idol if anyone should, should see you eating it will not the conscience of that person be made weak okay so that person is fearful of idols that person does not have the right understanding about food offered to idols right he still thinks that hey this is food offered to idols and therefore it is you know it is blessed by the idol or it has some power you know uh, to bring you to god or whatever it is or is fearful of that now when you as a believer strong believer when you eat it in the temple the conscience of that person who is weak is wounded right the conscience is made weak is this um and then he says because of your knowledge verse 11 because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom christ died so which means his conscience is made weak he probably compromises he probably i don't know you know he's talking about you know saying shall the weak brother perish right which leads him away from god which leads him away from maybe make a compromise and maybe he even goes back to idol worship whatever right because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom christ died but when you sin thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience you sin against christ therefore if food makes my brother stumble i will never again eat meat lest i make my brother stumble so he gives his reason okay we have freedom we have authority it's not going to affect us in any way right because you don't you're not going to eat it as an act of worship you're not participating in the worship right but then what will actually affect what will make it sin is when the person who is weak in faith the person who is maybe a not a strong believer weak in faith maybe a new believer you are encouraging that person to fall or encouraging or in the sense you are making that person to fall is a stumbling block so that is why he is saying it is best that we don't eat food offered to idols okay any questions ji yeah. about this uh, eating like food which is dedicated to the uh, idols first so from my childhood i heard like these things in my in our areas like we cannot take these things because it is like uh, offered to the idols and uh, some incident i heard like this i don't know how it's true or false okay. but from some people i heard the believers uh, uh if they took they got harm in the body mm. uh i'm not sure about the how much true it is but uh, the news is like that like some took some people took the things which is offered to the idol and they got affected in their body mm. so what 
or you take from these things like yeah so the thing is this that which means that you know as a believer i've still not i'm not walking in that authority i still consider this as something maybe powerful something maybe you know so I, i'm not walking in the authority which god has given me right or i've not fully realized that i have authority over these things and therefore you know i'm letting it affect me right because from paul's side he's very clear he's you see the kind of scenario he's painting right he's describing he's saying okay you, you are in a in a temple inside the temple and you are eating the food not at home or any other place you are in the temple and somebody is given you you know uh, food offered uh, offered to the idol some kind of a prasad or offering you are in the temple and you are eating it so that's the kind of thing that he's saying so he's saying it will be fine if not for the weaker brother isn't that what he's saying in chapter 8 isn't that what he's saying right it will be fine if you were even if you were inside and eating if not for the weaker brother because idol food of a idol is nothing so he's you know just taking away he's is pointing to the fact that god is everything god is sovereign he is all powerful he and he has vested us as believers with the authority so you need to know your place in god in christ because you are there representing god to cast out not to be you know fearful of but in this particular thing as you know people uh, who are affected right um, so the question is again like are they walking in authority are they walking in like this knowledge right understanding that wait hey, it, it cannot do anything to me but even if you eat it with the with fear what if something happens or uh, you know wait eat it with unbelief right not with faith eating it with unbelief uh, i don't know maybe something will happen or this fear and then we are actually opening the door for that that thing to work against us so so that's the thing and like i i think i should i should also probably share my personal experience i was not a believer i was in first year of college i know this happened so as all first year students we were supposed to go for this you know the temple thing and i could not say no i went and i was not a believer i was just a nominal you know christian so i just went there uh then a happily ate came back and you won't believe that that day there was a that you know that was the only thing that i think i ate which was very different but there was a stomach upset and you know food poisoning kind of a thing that whole night and uh, the next morning my mother asked okay so uh, why why what happened where did you go then i told her i went this and she asked no did you eat this i said yes so i was not a believer i did not know the authority that i have i went ahead and you know i was part of the worship actually i as went ahead being and ate it as something that was part of the worship and it affected me right so yeah so we know that that can happen right but the opposite of it where you can reign in circumstances is true like the position authority power that god has vested in us as believers that's the truth so that's why paul is saying don't think that i'm telling you not to eat because of this that idol is something that idol is powerful or food offered to the thing is going to you know create some havoc in you no i'm not saying th- the reason why you should not eat is because you will make another person who's not weak i mean who's not strong you will make that person stumble so is you know you're saying that is the reason not because anything else right yeah um yeah, in some other places like when we go to the bank in the afternoon some friday bank is it bank okay they will do some if they are there they tend to give uh, if, if yeah. our option can take or not take eh? and yeah. second thing like some neighbors there some puja they may not call us but they send some food mm. then uh, during the relig- this festival time the lot of sometime food comes all this we'll see with lot of fear and you know uh. we are not going to the temple mm. there this happened we sometimes used to throw it out 
because nobody's seeing us. Mm. So how should we, you know, face the thing? So, so the thing is this, you know, when somebody says uh, openly, like chapter ten, as he is going to actually talk about that, you know, when someone comes and says this was offered to an idol, so that's why he says, uh, if someone says to you, I'm I'm just skipping, I'm going to chapter ten, verse uh, twenty eight. If someone someone says to you, this was offered to idols, and he says, do not take it, take it for the sake of the person who told you, and for conscience' sake, because the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, but uh, I say for conscience because not for your own, but for the sake of the other person. So either you explain that you know I'm not I'm taking it, but I'm not as a prasad or anything. To if you can you know if you can do that. But if you if someone is saying you know this is special, this is offered, it's from you know whatever place, uh, it's from this such and such a place and all that. You can politely refuse. Why? Not because it's going to affect you in any way, because it's you know it's it's coming from that place, it's coming from the temple. No, it's not because of that. But for the sake of the other person who thinks that this is a this is a deity and this has been offered and so you know it's something special, right? So for you to take part in that worship, you know, if it comes like that, then you can politely refuse and say no, I don't, I don't take these things. You can do that. Right. See, the thing is, in a country like ours, if you go to any like uh, Suksagar or you know any, anything, you know, everything is first offered to the idol. First of all, you know that, right? They cook it, they call upon the deity's uh, blessing, which means we can't go anywhere. We can't go eat masala dosa or that chutney or the thing. Everything is blessed, right? blessed, quote unquote. So the thing is, okay, you pray, you eat. But if someone says, okay, this was part of a worship and therefore you know, we give you the reason for you not taking it is that you're explaining, you know, I don't want to be part of this worship and I don't consider this as a special thing. I don't consider this as a deity, as God. Therefore, you know, you politely refuse. Uh, and also be on because of another person who might be a weaker, you know. So that's the reason for refusing so that's the thing mm. yeah i mean you just pray and eat that's it <laughs> like recently what happened pastor like sorry uh, what? recently no, we are saying pg right so they gave us a uh, laddu with a uh, rice so i asked hmm. uh, is this is offered to pujas and all so he said no so I took it. Okay. So after some days, what happened? Like uh, there's something puja going on. Ganesha something. So they kept something. I was I didn't add, but Bimal ate. <laughs> okay. And uh, he came to me. I don't. You add. You know that's uh, offered. No, but yeah, I don't know. Uh -huh. So I told and uh, I told like if you, if unknowingly we're eating, nothing will happen. Uh -huh. But if knowingly we're eating, eating, it's a uh, good or not good. So so that's the same thing. You know, even knowingly, if you eat, it's not that it's it's got anything to affect you. You as a believer, you have the greater one in you, because Bible is very clear. Greater is he who is in you that is in the world. The food of a idol is nothing. Idol is nothing. All that, you know, that is a truth. So therefore, it's fine. But the reason for refusal, Bible is very clear. You know, if there's someone saying, hey, you know, it's very something very special. It's, it'll actually be a blessing for you. Uh, it's blessed, and so please take it. Then you say, you know, oh, you know I don't think I, because I don't believe, and I don't think I should take it. I hope you understand, please. Yes, yeah, exactly. Okay, a couple of I think there's a question here. In workplaces, food offered idols will be given where there won't be any believers. Is it right to eat or not? Okay, so for the sake of the other person's conscience, also you, you know, that's what we saw in chapter ten. Uh, for the sake of the other person, where the other person comes and says, you know, this is blessed and this was offered to an idol, so it, you know, it is something special, so please take. For the person, for the sake of the other person who has come and who has considered that as a blessing, and um, for the sake of that, you refuse. It's not because it's going to hurt you anything, but for the sake of that, you can you refuse, right? Um, but you know, some people are very radical. 
whether it's you know whether it's prasad whether it's whatever they will just bless bless it right in front of their eyes they're saying bless it and then eat it no you know they'll just do it only thing is they need to consider the other believer who's not strong enough that's the other thing yeah you, you have a question yeah go ahead uh, pastor my question is regarding the the communion of roman catholics mm we can have it or not yeah so communion of uh, roman catholic uh, okay okay this is a separate question but uh, so what does it signify you know so the understanding is that that the wafer is the lord's body literally right so the word used there is transubstantiation or something right where the person i think uh, probably nina can <laughs> explain a lot more so that is the thing so when you're taking part what are you saying you're saying i'm one with christ first of all you're identifying that um, the death burial and resurrection so that is the understanding then we are also saying you know as believers you know we are one body okay so two things we are saying we as believers we are one body in christ and we are part of that same body and uh, and therefore you know we are um uh, we're saying you know as the bread which we break is it not the body of christ and therefore you know we are all part of the body spiritual body but the thing is can you say that in that in that thing we can't and we cannot because the very understanding with which it is given is different right so that is the thing so it is better that because it's it's not that it's again you know it's you know this kind of a thing it's going to affect you in any way or it's not from that point of view but really what is the truth of what we are doing you know it's not from truth then don't do it so from that perspective it's better that we stay away and also again you know when they they know that you are not a catholic they will not give right they'll very clearly say only for catholics please come so father francis can go <laughs> but, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. nice thing okay so you know counterfeit signs if something is miraculous there's always a counterfeit it can happen right we see about we read about you know sai baba and vibhuti coming from his hand and all that people say okay maybe it's a trick but i'm thinking maybe it's a counterfeit sign the pharaoh's uh, court the magicians did the same thing they did it you know their rod also they threw down it became a snake but ultimately this snake swallowed that other snake so counterfeit thing is possible so yeah exactly yeah definitely the, yeah when there's no foundation of truth then you know there's no it happened in a thing so therefore it, you know people get uh, yeah excited hey once my friend and i were outside and we were hungry and saw these people of other faith going on a rally and distributing food we took thank god for it and ate nothing happened praise god <laughs> as prince sharing okay <laughs> okay right so i think we are clear right uh, so we'll we'll get into more details in chapter 10 right so okay let's let's move on to chapter 9 where paul talks about uh, apostleship right he is just kind of um uh, addresses a kind of different issue than uh, um than food of idols or anything else that he's been addressing so far right um so in the corinthian church you know like first corinthians or also second corinthians we'll see that people actually challenged paul's claim to be an apostle right uh, is he really an apostle is he really a, and and you know we we get to know something about that from the fact that people were saying i'm of paul i'm of apollos right we see that in the earlier chapters that there was division because of that in second corinthians also we see that paul actually writing to talk about all the things that he went through as an apostle and he writes about false apostles you know false ministers of god who come to um kind of take things from people and not to you know give sacrificially and so on so he talks about that also so so he is he's, he's uh, writing about you know he's asking that question 
at the outset, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? So that is his reason for asking those questions. Now we know, you know, the, uh, if you uh, studied about um, the ministry gift of the apostle, it's, it's already done. Uh, ministry of the apostle, pastor, evangelist, teacher, and then the apostle also, you know, you have. Uh, right? So there are di different categories of apostles. One is the twelve apostles of the Lamb, right, which means people who walked with Jesus and whom the Lord selected and he called them apostles, apostles of the Lamb. Then we have also this founding apostles like, like uh, Paul, who, whom the Lord used in bringing revelation to the church, in writing the, you know, the, the, the word of God, uh, and so on. Then what we see in Ephesians 4 is the ministry gift, one of the fivefold gifts of ministry gifts of the apostles. So, you know, we have all these categories, right? So, yes, Paul was not someone who was an apostle of the Lamb. You know, he was not someone who walked with Jesus. In that sense, you know, he was not an apostle of the Lamb. But he was someone whom God used as someone who was sent by God, commissioned by God. God used that, Paul, to write two-thirds of Scripture, to put in the doctrine, foundations of the church, and so on, right? So um, God used him. So, so he's saying, you know, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? So we know he's, he's, he's addressing that encounter that he had with the Lord, um, what he heard from the Lord, and are you not my work in the Lord? Right? He shared the gospel, church was established, and saying, are you not my work in the Lord? So if I'm not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you, for you are my the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Like the seal of that, the proof of that ministry. So he's saying, um, you know, you are my seal, and and he's saying, do we have no right to eat or drink? So he's, he's from verse three onwards. He's giving some reasons um, for a, a, as a defense for his apostleship, apostleship, and also you know the kind of life that he lived, the kind of ministry that he did as an apostle. Right. So he's saying, do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord, and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Because you know they actually worked with their hands and supported the ministry. They did, of course, others also supported, but pretty much they worked with their hands. So he's saying, you know, whoever goes to war at his own expense, normally the the nation which sends people, soldiers to war, they are the ones who uh, who actually finance the war. So he's talking about that. And who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its own fruit? So, so he's saying the, these are the rights of a, uh, an apostle. Um, so Old Testament the law of Moses also says that you shall not, verse 9, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out grain. Is it oxen that God is concerned about? Or is there a principle there that those who, uh, you know, Partake can actually those who minister can also partake from whom they are ministering to, receive financially whom they are receiving, whom they are ministering to. And verse eleven he says, "If we have sown spiritual things to you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? If others are partakers of this right, are we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not used this right." But endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple? And those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar. Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. But I have used none of these things, nor have I written these things, that it should be done so to me. For it, be, it would be better for me to die than that anyone should make my boasting for it. Okay, so, so he's talking about the rights that any minister of God and specifically all the other apostles had. Right, um, so they took along their spouse. They others were ministering to materially from whomever they ministered to. They were receiving expenses, finances, whatever, right, material things. So he said, you know, he, even though it was a right. He did not make use of that, right? Even though it was okay, 
okay to receive, okay to do all this. He did not do this. He chose to sacrifice so that the gospel would not be hindered by any chance. Right? So he says, if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Okay, so for, for Paul, this apostleship, you know, this calling, and also this sharing of the gospel, he's saying it's a necessity, right? Um, I have nothing to boast of. In fact, woe unto me right? if I do not preach the gospel. So if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if I against my will, he's saying this preaching the gospel is also a stewardship. Right? It is a responsibility that he is overseeing. Okay? It is a first of all, it's a necessity. He says, you know, I have to. I've been, you know, I have experienced the gospel, so I have experienced salvation. So it's necessary. You know, it's something that is laid upon me. If I if I don't preach the gospel, woe unto me. You know, let something terrible happen to me saying but he's also saying that this is something that has been entrusted to me it's a stewardship it's an accountability to god and to people there's a responsibility right so whatever god has put on him whatever revelation god has given him about the gospel and the gifts and so on saying this is something that i need to steward well right a steward meaning i have this responsibility i have to oversee it i have to share it I have to make sure that others receive it, so on, right? Okay. So, um, verse 19 onwards, saying, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became as Jews, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, but not being without law toward God, but under law towards Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Right? So, Paul is talking about how he um, he does the ministry, right? How he became all things to all people, all men. Uh, but definitely, while doing this, he's saying, "I don't compromise on God's standards," right? So he's saying, "Not as those without the law, right? Not as a person who does not have a law toward God, without law toward God." Verse twenty-one, right? But under law towards Christ, right? whatever is permissible. Right? So he's talking about there is no compromise on truth. Okay? So what are the kind of people he's talking about? Jews, people who are non-Jews, people who are even weak. Right? The intention is that I want to win them to God. I want to win them to Christ. I do it for the sake of the gospel. right? But just because I want to be relevant, just because I want to, you know, win them to Christ, he does not, you know, he says, I don't compromise on the standards, compromise on the truth. Okay. And that is very clear. Not as being, verse 21 talks about that, not being without law toward God. Okay. So he's not doing anything that is unlawful or anything that is not right in the sight of God, just because he wants to reach people or be relevant for people. So which means that some things that are cultural, some things that are maybe customs, is fine. As long as it doesn't go against the truth. As long as it doesn't go against scripture, is what he's saying. right? So not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. Okay, so so that means that, uh, yes, he's sacrificing, he's making some sacrifices, he's building some bridges, right? He's making himself relevant at the same time, not at the cost of truth. Okay, So that is a lesson for us. You know, in our wanting to be relevant, are we compromising truth? 
you know are wanting to be relevant to people and uh, you know appearing friendly and you know inviting for the gospel and church and everything are we lowering the standards of god right compromising the standards of god so what are some things that you need to you know uh, not compromise and saying this is priority this cannot be changed and what are some things you know that's something that you need to look at right in if we want to be relevant we need to look at that and not change that right okay um right so um so those those are some things that he's saying so some takeaways could be that that uh, serving god is about serving people to see their lives transformed by the gospel um serving requires sacrifice and which he willingly gave up certain rights certain luxuries certain comforts right as as a minister of god he said okay i'm serving god i'm not going to do this though others are so that is another something you know that is another thing that we need to be mindful of you know you cannot compare you know maybe you are giving up some things you do it as unto god you do it because you want to serve god okay so you don't have to compare that sacrifice that you are making with others right compare and and also say that okay everyone should have the kind of sacrifice that i'm living you know the kind of sacrifice that i'm making and i don't need to we don't need to do that right um and again is talking about serving god as a stewardship something that is a responsibility that needs to be accountable to god accountable this is a responsibility towards people right and also saying um, serve willingly by being relevant by being building a bridge uh, entering into their world right uh, but not at the cost of sacrificing truth then serving god requires discipline okay that's the last thing okay so this is we look at verse 24 onwards he's saying you know do you not know that those who run in a race verse 24 all run in a race all run but one receives the prize so run in such a way that you may obtain it and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things now they do it to obtain a perishable crown but we for an imperishable crown therefore i run thus not with uncertainty and thus i fight not as one who beats the air but i discipline my body and bring it into subjection lest when i have i have preached to others i myself should become disqualified okay so um so he's talking about his personal life his personal outlook when it comes to journeying with christ so he's saying i run this race not as someone who is running you know without the prize or what but i run as one who receives the prize which means there is focus there is intention and i want to do it well right i want to my objective is to get the prize so i run in such a way right? so which means i live my life so he's talking about living his life living or doing the ministry with that focus being intentional i'm not doing it you know i want results right so there's focus there's objective there's a goal in doing ministry so all that we learn right so when we are there when we are, when we are you know doing something uh, maybe it's you know small things like a bible study this worship this you know uh, maybe this preaching whatever it is you do it with intention we do it with the intention of fruit we do it with uh, with a way in other words run in such a way to obtain the prize you know, let that be your outlook right? um and then he's talking about okay is comparing that to a, a race a human race or human uh, you know competition when a person who competes for that right, competes for that prize competes for this kind of a a tournament or a competition they live a life that is disciplined okay they live a life that is temperate right? i think a great example is you know uh, quite recently in the olympics right talks about how a few grams right 100 grams was it that disqualified the wrestler right so in that weight category it was just a uh, 100 grams which made a difference that the person could not you know participate disqualified so 
people who compete at that level in sports um, live a life of great discipline, right? So he's saying, you know, they do that so that they can get a prize, and that prize is a perishable prize. Right? It's it's only for this world. People will re remember it. People may not, you know, remem remember it as years goes by. So it's something perishable, and uh, it stays with the world, and that's it. But when we minister, when we live our life, we do so for an imperishable crown, right? We do it for eternal reward. We do it for something that's long-lasting, that goes beyond this world. So how much more disciplined, how much more focused should our living be? Right? So that is what he's saying, you know. Therefore, I run this, run thus, sorry, not with uncertainty. So which means I run the race with certainty. I live my life with the focus and certainty. Right? And then he also talks about a fight. You know, I fight not as one who beats the air, right? Not as one who is unsure of what kind of, you know, what kind of enemies that you're fighting or just not just wildly swinging or your know, hands or no, not as that. Saying, I discipline my body, I bring it into subjection. I discipline my, my, myself, I, I do it. I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Because when I preach to others, I don't want to become disqualified. Because if I don't do that, then there is a possibility that I drift. There's a possibility that I come to a place of getting disqualified. It is a real possibility. So he's saying, you know, as a person who's serving, as a person who is an apostle, uh, this is a standard that he has in running the race, which is just a figurative thing to say that this is how I live my life. Right. So for him, living the life, you know, several things that we learn, right? For him, living the life, sharing the gospel is the same thing. His life, he lived that life to share the gospel. It's necessity for him. He lived in such a way that he might win the prize. Right? It was not just drifting, just um, just going through life without any certainty. No, he lived in a way that he ministered in a way so that there might be focus, there might be fruit. Right? And what enabled him to live in such a manner was this sense of discipline that he had over his own body. Um, he says, this is what I did because I see the people who have discipline, who are competing in sports, which is of no eternal value. But for such a thing, they, they compete with discipline. So how much more for when we compete for a, or when we live our life for an imperishable crown? Right? So with that, uh, it comes to the end of this chapter. Right? So any questions before we wind up? Any further questions on this? Okay. okay. So um, we'll, we, uh, you know, next class we'll go into chapter ten, where he again addresses um, issues like um, food offered to idols and also head covering and and so on. Right. Okay. So we'll stop here. Thank you. Bless.